Hello and welcome to the channel of the Whiteboard Doctor. For all those of you who are prescribed, not prescribed, that would be the wrong word, subscribed Whiteboard Doctors, uh, welcome back. Thank you for checking out videos, subscribing, following along. Uh, hopefully you're learning a little something as we always are. For those of you who are new to the channel, uh, thank you very much for checking us out. Please check out other videos if you see fit, subscribe, hit the bell, whatever you choose to do. Uh, we are a free open access medical education channel uh, here to learn with and from you and hopefully produce some content that you guys find valuable for your education and learning. Um, today we are finishing a series on abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, it started with an introductory video, which I will link in the top right, um, and then we went through kind of uh, the differential diagnosis using a mnemonic called Palm-Cohen. So I'll just write that out here. So we talked about P, which was endometrial polyp. We talked about A, which was adenomyosis. We talked about L, which was lyomyoma, and we talked about M, which was Fernometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma. Um, this video is actually going to wrap it all up by talking about some smaller topics, which is going to be the Cohen, right? And in the top right corner, I wrote what we're going to discuss. We're going to talk about coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial causes outside of endometrial hyperplasia, and then iatrogenic causes. Okay, so I uh, linked a bunch of the palm videos in the top right corner. Um, for you guys to check out, and then it's probably valuable to just check out the at least the introductory abnormal uterine bleeding video um, before you watch this video, um, just to get some background. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is coagulopathy. So with abnormal uterine bleeding, it would make sense that if a patient was coagulopathic, they might have increased bleeding as compared to someone who wasn't. Um, so about 13% of women who have menorrhagia, which is heavy periods, have a disorder of hemostasis. The differential for that is going to be things like von Willenbrand's factor disease, right? Immune thrombocytopenia purpura, hemophilia A or B, which is factors eight or nine, right? Hemophilia A or B. And then platelet function defect, so I'll just do platelet PLT defect. Um, this can be things like Glanzmann's, Bernard Solier, all those. So when you think about coagulopathy, the differential includes primarily these things. And interestingly, 13% of women that present with menorrhagia have coagulopathy, which is more than I would have uh, anticipated um, if you were just asking me before I kind of read up on it. Um, clinical manifestations of coagulopathy in terms of uh, uterine bleeding uh, and beyond that are going to be things like what we talked about, menorrhagia, which is heavy periods, as well as menorrhagia, which is bleeding in between your periods or a combination of the two. Um, you also have you know the typical things for coagulopathy, so easy bruising, nosebleeds, right? gum bleeds, when they brush their teeth, post-op or postpartum bleeding, um, all the things that you kind of would think about um, independent of the menorrhagia or metrorrhagia. So a patient with coagulopathy who has abnormal uterine bleeding, a lot of the history and physical actually can tease out whether they're at risk for coagulopathy because you should see some of these other things such as easy bruising, bleeding gums, nosebleeds, etc. Um, that will risk stratify them and make it more likely to be coagulopathy. Um, to diagnose this, right, it's kind of common things being common. Um, whoa, that's wild. Okay, let's erase that fun symbol. Good. Um, diagnosis. They're going to be obvious things, right? So you're going to want a CBC to see how anemic they are. You're going to want coags because that'll help you kind of tease out if they're coagulopathic, but not always. I mean, if you have a really high suspicion, right, someone comes in with bleeding gums with brushing their teeth, frequent nosebleeds, they have bruising more than five centimeters and menorrhagia, um, it's probably worthwhile. I mean, they should see a hematologist, but it's probably worthwhile to send uh, one von uh, Willenbrand's factor. That's a Terrible writing. I'm on fire today. So we'll just do this. So probably worthwhile sending factor eight, right? Von Willenbrand's factor. Um, within the CBC, you'll have your platelets already. And then these patients who you're really worried about should see a hematologist as well. All right. 
And then treatment, I mean, we're not going to go into because the treatment is highly dependent on etiology, right? So the treatment for immune thrombocytopenia uh, versus hemophilia A and B are quite, quite different. So um, for abnormal uterine bleeding, patients who are coagulopathic, it's a higher percentage than you would anticipate, but a good history and physical can kind of tease those ones out. And once you have done that, they should see a hematologist and get some more advanced laboratory workup. Okay. Ovulatory dysfunction is next. Ovulatory dysfunction. So this is kind of a bucket category for more systemic things that can cause ovulatory dysfunction. Um, some examples of this are polycystic ovarian syndrome, or abbreviated PCOS, hypothyroidism, can, and then uh, prolactinemia. I'll just say hyperprolactinemia can as well. And then a whole bucket of others, right? And for this, I'm not going to probably write all these out, but um, exercise, intense eating disorders, stress. Um, I already spelled exercise wrong. Good start. So stress, eating disorders, um, antidepressants, antipsychotics, corticosteroids, some liver and kidney disease, all those kinds of things can cause ovulatory dysfunction. Um, this is going to often be anovulatory, so no menses or oligoovulatory, right? So just uh, um, abnormal uh, menses, like you don't have frequent enough menses, and when you do, sometimes it'll be multiple per month, etc. Um, for the clinical manifestations, it's obviously highly dependent on what's causing it. So like patients with uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome will often hear statism, so excess hair growth, obesity, diabetes, uh, hypothyroidism might have some of those other symptoms of hypothyroidism, cold intolerance, so cold intolerance, uh, weight gain, increased weight, dry skin, diarrhea, or I apologize, constipation um, would be another one. Uh, and then hyperprolactinemia um, often has decreased libido, galacteria, right? I don't know if some of these are coming back to y'all. Uh, homonymous hemianopia, if you have a uh, significant mass compressing the optic chiasm, um, which, since the causes are so different, um, diagnosis and treatment is also highly different, right? So we're just going to continue in the same line. So um, things you're going to want, right? You're going to want FSH, LH, um, actually, let's change that. So we're going to FSH, LH, androgens. For all these, you will, but I mean, for this, you're going to want a thyroid screen. For this, you're going to want a prolactin level. And then the treatment, the management is going to be all different as well. So for PCOS, you're going to want things like clomiphene. Clomiphene, which induces ovulation. You know, you're going to want metformin for your insulin resistance. OCPs can help regulate cycles. Uh, for hypothyroidism, you're going to want, you know, levothyroxine or synthroid. For hyperprolactinemia, you're going to want bromocryptine, which is going to inhibit. Uh, production of prolactin, um, if it, you know, really bad, a transphenoidal pituitary adenectomy. So I'll just write surgery, but it's a transphenoidal pituitary adenomectomy. Um, and once you've ru ruled all that out, you kind of start to focus more in on these other things. So good history and physical, um, do they have a lot of stress? Do they have uh, like uh, extremely high tense exercise and all those kinds of things? Um, but first you want to think about some of these more hormonal things, prolactin, thyroid, um, and then the general category of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, so that's ovulatory dysfunction. Um, then we get into this kind of... Uh, um, Additional larger groups of things. So with the E for Cohen, right, is endometrial causes, endometrial causes outside of endometrial hyperplasia 
or, met, or carcinoma because we already talked about those within the palm portion. Um, these are going to be like um, uh, primary disorders and regulation of endometrial hemostasis. So it's, it's more vague things, right? So it's like uh, deficiencies in local vasoconstrictors, which is going to cause you to have abnormal uterine bleeding. That's not how you spell deficiencies. Um, let's see here. Maybe it is. No, that looks good. I'm going to take it back. I think that's it. So deficiencies in local vasoconstrictors, accelerated lysis of endometrial clots, endometrial clot lysis, some of those kinds of things. And then also you can have a disorder in endometrial repair, which is usually from like a infections or inflammatory conditions. So the endometrial causes within palm cone are kind of some of these more vague, uh, chronic, uh, less defined illnesses such as deficiencies in vasoconstrictors, accelerated endometrial clot lysis, chronic inflammation, inhibiting endometrial repair, etc. Um, then we can get iatrogenic causes, which is the I in Cohen. And these are things you kind of would Think about causing quote unquote breakthrough bleeding. Some things that come to mind are placement of IUDs, right? Good adult steroids can cause breakthrough bleeding. Certain medications, such as anticoagulants, blood thinners, um, can cause breakthrough bleeding. And then you have the biggest, you know, box of them all, which is the N of palm cone, which is not yet classified. Helpful, I know. Um, but this melting pot are things like AV malformations in the endometrium, um, things like myometrial hypertrophy, All these things can also cause endometrial bleeding, but they don't really fit a general category. So to finish out the series, um, the Cohen portion, the C-O-E-I-N, um, is going to be coagulopathy, which we talk about here, ovulatory dysfunction, um, endometrial causes, iatrogenic causes, and not less yet classified causes. So the Cohen portion is a lot less... Um, uh, satisfying than the palm portion of the differential diagnosis for abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, check out some other videos if you would like to. Um, ask any questions, comments, concerns. Um, let us know what you think, and uh, we look forward to hearing back from you and hopefully seeing you back for additional videos in the future. Thank you very much. Have a good day.